I want to talk to you today about person-centered care because that's the crux of everything. When we think of person-centered care, I can't think of a better definition than the one that the Institute of Medicine has created for us, and that is providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, values, and ensures the patient values guide all clinical decisions. When you are when you have this definition firmly ingrained in your mind as an individual practitioner and as a team, it is much easier to link and retain patients in care because that means we're, we don't have a recipe just like we don't for tobacco intervention. It would be nice if I was running a tobacco intervention class here and we were all here and we'd been coming for a week and we all decide today we're going to quit, we're going to stand up, sit down, say I quit and that's it and we go along our day and we no longer use tobacco products. We would like to think that any disease it would be possible to learn, to understand and to have this recipe where everybody succeeds at at stopping those risky behaviors that create poor health for us and poor health outcomes. But that doesn't work that way. Care is very individualized. And yes, it takes more time, but the impact on outcome, patient outcome, as well as population health outcome is tremendous. And I've seen it before my own eyes. So I'm here today to sort of sing my choir song about how important it is to be sure that we are delivering patient-centered and person-centered care. So what does that mean? Well, we've got culture, we've got language, we've got gender to consider. We certainly have socioeconomic variables that we have to consider. And then we have health status va uh, values that we have to look at. What does health look like in the community in which we live and that we work? Who are our patients? Well, my patients in the Virgin Islands, you're meeting them right now, all ages, uh, and, and I'll add the little baby there. We have children still being born in the Caribbean who are HIV positive. And the cultural term, uh, vertical transmission, is a much better term than saying mother to child transmission. And what would be the reason for that? Why would I not want, if I want to be culturally respectful, why would I not use mother to child transmission when I'm talking to a family? Right, it assigns blame immediately. And I don't know the particular situation, but I certainly wouldn't want to start out my interaction with a family and become across as blaming the mother for transmitting this disease to her child. So we say vertical transmission in order to be sensitive and non-judgmental to the situation at hand. So thank you for that, I appreciate that. So here we have a person that has been diagnosed with HIV and they face many issues. We have a continuum of care that has been developed for HIV treatment and care that could be applied to any disease. These elements, these five elements that I'm going to share with you could be used for the treatment of diabetes. It could be used for the treatment of heart disease. It especially works in a disease such as HIV AIDS where you have a population impact, where you have transmission factors that are going on that create communities of ill health or of not people that are not well. So what does this continuum of care look like? Well, you can see on the big screen here that it begins with testing or diagnosis. And of course, we always want to do more testing, but there are stigmatizing conditions for which a lot of people will not get tested or choose not to be tested. Then we have that diagnosis of the people that test, do we get a diagnosis? And then we try to link these individuals to care if they stick with us and if we stick with them. It'd be very easily at this point for someone to be lost to care. And in the old days, we would just say, okay, here, you are positive, and now here's the provider that can assist you. And we would just expect that the person would go and get linked to care, miraculously. But it didn't happen that way, and a lot of people never showed up. Then we hope that someone who finally gets to the provider that may be able to give them the best possible treatment and care, that they stay in care, and they get a prescription for antiretrovirals, which they continue to take for as long as they live, that gives them health, wellness, and the opportunity to live as long as they would have lived if they didn't have HIV. And I'm here to tell you that that is possible. 
and it can happen if we keep people in care. But that's not how this looks. And the HIV continuum gives us a model by which we can really look at what is happening with our populations, with our communities. Where are we missing patients? So we've got diagnosis, linkage to care, and then the last three elements, retention, getting, taking the medication that's prescribed to keep the viral load suppressed, and then finally an undetectable viral load. With an undetectable viral load, you then have less transmission. All right? So I want to get us all on the same page. Here is the HIV care cascade for 2012 in the United States. Ooh, suddenly I'm using a new word, cascade. Why didn't I use the word continuum? When you apply statistics to the continuum, we call it a cascade. I was always wondering, why am I using these two terms? And are they interchangeable? Well, you will see that they're misused, but when you have numbers and you're looking at population health, we call it a cascade. And as you can see here, in 2012, we had 82% of the folks that we could find diagnosed with HIV. The rest of the percentage are people that we didn't find, maybe because they didn't come in to be tested. Then you have linked to care. Of those 82%, 66% were actually linked to care. They actually got to a provider. And we actually have definitions for all of this. And then retained in care. Of the 66%, we had 37% retained in care, meaning they kept coming back for more than one visit. Eeks, that's a big jump, isn't it? That's a spiral down. And then prescribed antiretroviral. Of the 37% left, we had 33% that were prescribed, meaning they were given a prescription for three, which is the the best treatment possible, three medications. Not all those medications, they're not necessarily separate. Some might be in one, three might could be in one pill. For those of you who are familiar with the treatment of HIV, there may be two pills involved, and in some cases there's three different pills involved. But every patient is on three different types of medication. And then finally we get viral suppression, which means that the viral load is what we call suppressed. And the definition that this particular cascade uses is less than 200 copies of the virus. All right? So it's not undetectable. I can still see it in a lab uh, value, but it is very, very low. Hence, there will be less transmission. But this is a very sad, a, a sad story that I'm telling you here because we could do much better than this. And this is why we have so much HIV in our communities in terms of a population, because it keeps getting transmitted. I'm living right now in uh, Fort Lauderdale, which is the epicenter for the state of Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Last year, we were number one in the whole United States for new cases of HIV. Just out are the 2015 data, and we're number two uh, but 200 cases down from last year, and we're behind now California's number one. And the other states, New Jersey and New York, are right behind the, us. So this is an epidemic still, and a lot of people I talk to says, oh, I, I don't hear about HIV anymore. I thought it was pretty much resolved, and it, it's not the case. If you live in one of the epicenters like I do, it's part of daily life where you're thinking about it because you know there's a lot of people out of care and you know that the virus is very high. So what do we want? What, what would be our goal from a public health standpoint? How would we like this graph to change? Anybody? What would we like to see a high number of? We'd like to see it flipped, wouldn't we? With the inverse, okay. Would you like this one? Would that look better? Where you have very few people being diagnosed and you have all these people that are suppressed Right? With very, th those people that are living with the disease would have very high um, th they would be suppression so that this disease would not be um, transmitted as much as it is right now. So this is what we're aiming for. And yes, we can talk about it in these forums, but how do you do it? How do you do it case by case, person by person, family by family? So how do we close these gaps? that we're finding in this cascade that we just looked at. Well, culture plays a big part of it, 
and my experience in living in the territories as well as other places definitely confirm that. Culture, health, and well-being are very important aspects of what I believe are parts of individualized care. Culture is learned. We know that culture transmits values to our young people, the beliefs, the practices of a specific group, and our culture guides our thinking. It's like chicken soup, right? Chicken soup when you have a cold. I'm sure if we did a, a, a sit session and we all talked about what we know about health from our grandparents or from our great-grandparents or from our aunties or from our uncles or other family members, maybe from our, uh, our, our uh, religious affiliations, there would be certain things we would do when we're sick and we might still do them. Maybe when we're sick, we get a sore throat, we immediately go and get chicken soup. Maybe we go and we get a certain type of lozenger. Maybe we make a certain type of tea. How many people do honey and lemon when they've got a cough? Okay? These are things that are passed down in our culture. My grandmother used to give us a little bit of alcohol and put it on our throat to numb it. So again, these, these different practices are developed from a cultural standpoint. And so we have to think of culture as a lens by which our patients view the world. And not every child grows up in a family where we look at the calendar and say, oh gosh, family, looks like it's time for our yearly health check. Let's all go and get our immunizations, check our teeth, and let's take good care of ourselves and make sure we're growing and being healthy and that we're taking our medicines the way we should and eating well and that our weight is good for our age and for our stature. That's not happening, so we get our patients come in and they're coming in with a whole different view or lens of what health looks like. And hence that changes on an individual level how we approach working with them in terms of providing best treatment and care. So culture can influence an individual's understanding of priorities, the way people interact with us in the health system, the decisions about help-seeking behaviors, in the Virgin Islands, people don't come in if they're well to come to a clinic appointment. That's why we don't have retention and care there. You only go when you're sick. It would be disrespectful to come to the physician or a nurse for well health care. You only go when you are on fire, okay, literally or figuratively speaking. Same thing happened in Tennessee. My patients didn't come in for well checkups. They were working the farms there. They had other things more pressing. They came in when they couldn't breathe, when they were <sighs> sucking air because their obstructive lung disease was exasperated with bronchitis or some other disease uh, process that was going on. So this was very familiar to me when I went to the islands. That sense of preventative health care doesn't exist. It is what your priority is, is when you're sick or bad sick, as we called it in Upper East Tennessee, that's when you go see your doctor. So you might make an appointment out of respect for your physician and say, yes, of course I'll come back next month. Yes, of course I'll come back. But you didn't show up because there was no need to, because you felt good. And if those individuals that are here in, uh, in this room know that for many years a lot of our patients who are HIV positive feel very well. In fact, most people who are diagnosed with HIV very early onset, they're kicking their heels up and saying, I feel good. That test must be wrong. I think they got it wrong. And so there's no impetus to go in and see someone when you feel good, even though you have a test result that says you're HIV positive. There's nothing pulling you in. You don't have a sore throat. You don't have anything hurting you unless you're bad sick. And then, of course, you are in because you want immediate result. You want a fix it. So again, understanding where our patients are coming from, from a cultural standpoint. There are a couple of terms that I want to share with you. One is cultural diversity, and that's the state of having a variety of cultures in one area. And then cultural relevancy, as I use that term, I mean it to be that cross-cultural, multicultural, uh, care that we give, that care that we give when we know someone it has the lens of their culture and they see health and illness and prevention in a certain way. 
So I'm going to provide culturally relevant care, meaning I'm going to focus on those things that make them comfortable, that help me understand better why they're coming to appointments and why they're not coming to appointments, why they take medicines and why they don't take medications, why they eat what they eat and why they don't eat. All those things are important for me to learn so that I can provide individual care. So these are questions that I, I often ask about my patients, to or of them, you know, does the care that they're receiving, is it getting them closer to their goals? What are their goals in coming to my clinic? And I do know that a handout we can make available to you all. So if you're writing madly down, you know, relax, put your fingers down, and, and um, come on the ride with me. Um, I, I promise this information will be made available to you. A cultural construct is the idea that there are characteristics, just what we've shared before, that are under the umbrella of culture. Things such as religion and race and gender and ethnicity, all these categories can be defined by a culture that in which we live. So that's an important concept. Here we come back to cultural relevancy and how do we modify that care to accommodate a person's cultural needs? And that's what we're going to talk about. Well, we can't do it by being um, ethnocentric. Ethnocentrism is my culture is best, this is the way we do it, and I don't care what you do, but we're going to do it my way. That would lose you a lot of patience, and in the Virgin Islands where I spent a lot of time, I wouldn't have anyone in coming to the office if I had that temperament. In fact, when you come into the office in the Virgin Islands, it is culturally respectful for everyone, including providers, if you walk through the, the office uh, waiting room, is to say good morning, good afternoon, and good night. And if you don't say that, your ability to receive care goes down exponentially by the front desk. All right? So not only do you sign in, but you say to the entire waiting room, good morning and the entire waiting room says good morning back. If you slip through and sign in and look like you're rushed and when am I going to be seen and then you plop in your chair, you, will, you may wait to be the last patient seen. I know that doesn't sound fair, but that is culturally what happens in the Virgin Islands and in other Caribbean um, settings. So just to know what that culture is like. My daughter, uh, uh, had an injury on a basketball court and uh, severely injured her ankle and I went in ahead of her. She's hobbling in with her brother. I'm trying to get on the list and I say, good afternoon everyone. Everyone says good afternoon to me. We're on the list. My daughter hobbles in with her brother helping her and she's just in pain and so she plops down and she doesn't say anything and she's been now living there for four or five years and suddenly I see that she recognizes that something feels weird to her. She's looking around the room, everyone's down. She didn't get that warm welcome that you one usually gets. So she had her brother help her back up and in pain she said, good afternoon everyone. The entire waiting room said good afternoon and came over and asked her if they could get her anything and help her. She was first on the list. No, no, take her first, she's in pain. Okay, so again, a cultural, a, a wonderful cultural diverse type of thing to do, but if you aren't part of that, then you're probably not going to receive the type of care um, that you might like. And that's why people will come to Caribbean countries and say, I sat in the clinic all day and they didn't see me. I wonder what happened, right? Gives you a thought. So how does our patient explain their illness? What, how would they describe it? It's important for me as a provider to know what my client or patient thinks about this disease. Where did it come from? How is it affecting them? So I asked them, what, what do you think caused your sickness? Why did you become sick at this particular time, do you think? And oftentimes there'll be a story. Well, my, um, my husband uh, went on a drinking binge uh, or he didn't come home for two weeks and I was under stress and I think that's why um, my heart is hurting, and I think that's why I got the heart attack. So, so understanding what a client thinks about their illness and what caused it is very important because if I'm coming up and saying, well, you've got heart disease and uh, you know, you've got occlusion on uh, your carotid scan that we just did, 
that's not going to make sense to them because they're coming at it from a personal view that something in their life caused this thing to happen to them. So we're coming from different places and how do we come together to, de to develop that relationship and then that trust to develop a treatment and care plan that really works for that particular patient so that we can ensure that they stay well and that they don't have another heart attack. How do we do that? So we have the medical model, which most of us are very familiar with, and then we have the patient model. The medical model is one that we all know. What's the etiology? What's the differential diagnosis? Time and onset of all the symptoms. The patient model is looking at, wow, this happened to me. Oh, my husband left yesterday. Oh, that must be why it happened. Or um, my son never came home and he's been sort of MIA, living on the street for a week. I don't know where he is. Ah, that must be why I'm, my kidneys have acted up. Uh, many of you who have worked with people who have tobacco-related uh, illnesses, many of my patients would say to me, well, I was just out one day getting uh, on my tractor and suddenly I couldn't breathe. I mean, this isn't obstructive lung disease, whatever you think it is. This just happened to me yesterday. I mean, I, I've been fine up until yesterday. I was just on the tractor. And so then you have to find an analogy. Do you find yourselves using enough analogies to help your patients understand what's happening to them? My favorite analogy to use with individuals who thought obstructive lung disease started last night when they were putting their tractor away was, okay, what kind of pie do you like? And they'd look at me like, why are we talking about pie? I'm here because I can't breathe. And this was important for me to have this discussion. Of course, they're on oxygen. They're not in any kind of, you know, I haven't done anything where they're uncomfortable, but I need them to be on the same page with me. So how do I do that? I came up with an analogy called the pie analogy. And I'll say, what kind of pie do you like? And they'll say, uh, apple pie. I had a couple patients that said, I don't like pie, so that messed it up. But then I said, okay, what do you like that's round? So then I got donuts and pizzas and all kinds of fun stuff. But when, I, when they told me the apple pie, I said, well, when God made you, or the ultimate being that you believe in, um, you started smoking and using tobacco products. And unfortunately, little slices of your apple pie started disappearing. Now, God gave you plenty of pie to breathe. Right? But when you get to half a pie left, when all those little slivers start going away, you start to, you know, half a pie, you're starting to feel a little bit tight and it's getting a little harder to breathe and what you could do yesterday, you can't do today. Your lung scan, your breathing test that you just did for me shows me that you have a quarter of your pie left. Now don't, don't worry. I can make you feel, with your help, that you have more than a quarter of your pie left. We can do it through pulmonary rehab. We can do it through exercise, using your inhalers, through taking good care of yourself. I can help you feel better. But do you understand what's happening for you? And that pie story really started to take effect. Patients would go out and go into rehab and say, how much of pie do you have? How much of a pie do you have left? And then they would see someone very debilitated who had maybe 30% of their pie left and they only had like 20 and they'd say, well, I can do better than that. And so they would push the grocery cart faster and harder. They would work harder and use their, uh, the strategies that we were trying to implement from an interdisciplinary team approach to care and they would build up their bodies, their breathing. They would do all their breathing exercises and they had much more skin in their own treatment plan. So having analogies that help your patients understand what is happening to them, and I, I find that to be one of the most, the best things. So find out what culture you're working with and what would make sense. And I tell you, farm people, ranch people, they eat well. You know, they have to because they work hard, long, long hours, from early, early morning to late, late at night but they get three meals a day, most of them. And a pie is usually in part of that, one of those meals. So it gives us something to talk about, to laugh about, but to also get that important information about what is happening to their body. So the model is very important in how we translate what's happening for the patient. The patient's system of belief in terms of how 
and why this happened to them. Many of my patients who are Asian believe that they haven't, they're out of balance, that their yang and their yang is out of balance. So if they come in with a tooth problem and inflammation and bad gums, they'll tell me that there's a, uh, an imbalance in their liver. And that's good information for me because I, I do yoga, I am a former massage therapist, so I know that whole body health is very important. So I'll, I'll, I'll commend them and say, I love the way you're looking at the whole part of you. You're, you're looking at your entire body and the energy that is your balancing. Let me share a little bit about what we know about gums and let's try to put that together with your balance of energy and see if we can come up with a plan that makes sense for you. And then we go over all the herbals that their herbologist has given them so that I can better understand with the dentist what our next steps can be. But if I don't go through those steps, then I have a patient that is not engaged and most likely will not come back for services. And if they do, their heart won't be in it, which means that most likely the treatment will fail because they're not in it. We're doing something for them. They're not in the mix. They're not participating. So culture, families, and healthcare, also that family experience. When I work with Latino uh, uh, families, Hispanic families, sometimes it's about having the family in there with them. So I often ask, is there anyone else that you would like to have in this room as we have a conversation to talk about your lung health? or to talk about your HIV? Is there someone important that you have, in case of HIV, that you've disclosed to that would, that would make you feel good and you want them to hear this information? So we then make that happen if we can get that person into the room or at a future meeting. Again, that family piece may be very important to that cultural group. So the respect and appreciation of all cultural values and beliefs is really important in uh, focusing on individualizing patient care. I love the fact that we have so many unique different cultures out there and that there's so much for us to learn. So when we use that term, how many people have heard the term, we're going to have a cultural competency training? Cultural competency, okay. I don't like particularly the word competency because None of us could be competent ever in that. There's always something new to learn. Even in your own culture, there's something new to learn. So I, that's why I use the word cultural consciousness, cultural relevancy. I use other terms to say, yes, we can deliver cultural relevant, cultural sensitive care, but I really like the, uh, not using the word competent because I could never be personally could never be competent in delivering care to all cultures. It's not within my purview. Uh, so we want to look at different cultures and we're not talking about just ethnicity. We're talking about lifestyle and cultures of all types. So what is our clinic culture? We have our own culture in our own clinics. Do our patients that come in, all of them, do they feel welcome? Do they feel comfortable? Do they see pictures of themselves on the wall? Do they see other patients like them when they walk in the door? Are they greeted by someone at the desk that looks up at them and says, good afternoon, how can I care for you today? I had that happen at a homeless clinic in Orlando. I walked in, I'm a mystery shopper for some clinics in the state of Florida. They'll have me come in, I go to the front desk as a patient, I sign in, and nobody but one of the providers knows that I'm coming there that day, all right? What happens is I learn a lot, they learn a lot, and at the end of the day, we have a team meeting about what are they doing, what's their strength, what are some of the weaknesses, what do they want to improve on? And my favorite clinic so far in my whole life that I've ever been to was a homeless clinic that I walked up to the front desk and the woman looked me square in the eye and said, how can I care for you today? I thought I was going to fall over and die. No one had ever asked me that before. <laughs> and I said, I, you know, it's really hot outside. I, I wonder if I could get a glass of water. She said, absolutely. Just write your name here. Find a seat of your choice that's comfortable, and then I'll bring you a glass of water. I sat there. I said good afternoon to everybody in the waiting room. They said good afternoon to me. A little bit taken back, but I just do that now everywhere I go. 
And suddenly, this woman brings me a glass of water and says to be sure to come up if I need anything else. And I thought, this is going to be the best day of my life. I really did. And I now know why they had oodles and oodles of people waiting to be seen. Because you felt cared for. You felt like someone was really caring that you were there. So the culture of our clinics is so very, very important. And what do our patients think about that? Well, we've got to survey them. We've got to find out what are we doing well and what are we not doing well? I had one clinic that consulted with me because their transgender population were not feeling comfortable coming to clinic because of the name. If they wanted to be Jessica, if they were transitioning to Jessica, but their names on the books was Jason, the staff were having trouble in that resolving that. And f you could see the discomfort after I did a mystery shop. So what we've decided there is that we're giving beepers to the patients so that there's no name calling. It's a, your beeper comes, beeps off, and you go to the front desk, you give your beeper down, and then you go through a door and there's someone there to greet you. Because there was a, a sense that other people in the waiting room knew these individuals, knew them as Jason, but didn't know them as Jessica. So it was a lot of uh, very subtle and maybe not so subtle stigmatizing behaviors going on in the waiting room and at the front desk. So problem solving, critical thinking at its best at the clinic site itself, very important. So here's some pictures of what people might have in their clinics that help people feel engaged and feel welcome. What assumptions are we making in the clinic? Are we only getting a certain type of patient? I um, have been part of the testing initiative in the state of Florida where we're trying to get routine HIV testing a part of all primary care. And I sometimes will set up booths at uh, large medical provider educational meetings. What better time when the physicians are and, and other providers are coming out of the big auditorium like this and I'm standing right outside of my booth and I'm handing out goodies like water bottles and towels and I say, are you doing routine testing? You know, and they look at me and one of the physicians came up to me and says, I don't need to. I don't do routine testing because I don't have those kind of people in my, my practice. And I said, those kind of people? And he's whispering and I said, what would those kind of people be? And, you know, because I honestly, I was so, sort of shocked. And he says, well, my patients are nurses and firefighters and policemen and, you know, teachers. And I thought, and I said, gosh, well, I know a lot of people who are HIV positive who are teachers and who are firefighters. I, hospital, I know doctors. And he said, well, I just don't have those kind of people. And I said, yeah, you know, I'd love to talk to you. Is there an opportunity for me to come up to your clinic and bring all these resources that I have up to your staff? So he allowed me to come up there. And it's been a work of, a real work of patience to try to uh, uh, encourage uh, a, a, a different type of culture at his clinic. Because in his mind, he, he's not serving patients who are HIV positive. And he's basing that on their occupation, not on the fact that HIV is ageless and that everybody in all walks of life can have HIV. So again, another cultural aspect of care that's very, very important. I have this picture here of, of this young woman who has transitioned, uh, is uh, in the Coast Guard uh, four years ago and has transitioned uh, to female, male to female. So we don't know when these individuals may show up in our clinic and we want to be sure everyone feels welcome. And so how do we do that? What is the critical thinking that goes behind opening our doors and making people feel very good about them coming? We want to be sure that we're not stereotyping. And here's a great image of stereotyping people in the United States based on what state you're from. And find your state, right? I see people already pointing. You know, oh gosh, look at that. Yes, this is a type of stereotyping. And of course, we're all can be uh, go this route. It, it, it's hopefully, um, we, we, we're not doing it, but we are, and unconsciously, a lot of us do that. And this is what the population sees as well. You know, if you're from the Deep South, that means a certain thing about the way you eat, the way you live, what you know. But we know that's not really true. It's just stereotypic behavior. Making assumptions often leads to stigmatization 
It starts easily with name calling, pointing fingers quietly. I've seen it in waiting rooms, people talking like this, pss, 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 talking. And then it goes all the way down to the very end, harassment and actual violence and abuse. And I've seen that. I've seen people picking up their antiretrovirals from a clinic, going out that back door and being persecuted and being attacked. So I, I've seen the very worst. I've seen it subtly and it, it, it hurts no matter what behavior I'm seeing. It hurts and um, it's something that we have to be aware of in our clinics uh, and aware of in our communities. So how welcome do our patients feel? Are we of the clinic where we say, we are what you label me, i.e. the clinic labels the patient? I would prefer to see us give a patient a sticker that says, I'm in charge all day and every day, because really the patient is in charge of their own care, of their own treatment, and we are simply facilitators in how to individualize that care because we cannot go home with them, nor would we be able to because we would, I mean, we would never go home. So how do we impart on our patients the importance of their value as a member of the team, as a member of the care planning team? I can't tell you the number of charts that I review. I do uh, chart reviews, and I look in and I see uh, healthcare care plans, and I go from one chart to another, and I can't tell the difference. I couldn't tell you if this was Jessica or Jason or, or Raul or uh, Mr. Sanchez. I, I couldn't tell because each one is exactly the same. There's no individualization. I can't tell that anything, I'm not seeing that they're working on uh, a person that maybe understands that 25% of his pie is left and that he's working to go to rehab and that he's promised he's going to come three days a week. I, I'm not seeing that in the charts which is a sad thing because we're not individualizing that care. The patient is not engaged. So what is the stigma? Why do we see it? Well, it is, I think, related to mis misinformation. Misinformation can cause some great uh, uh, miscommunication. Uh, people don't understand that it's, you don't get HIV in a handshake. Uh, and there are many people out there still to this day that believe that casual contact brings transmission of HIV. And that stigma creates shame. It creates people rejecting themselves, feeling inadequate, getting anxious, feeling isolated from the rest of the world. They alone have this and they have no one to help them. The fear of being seen in a clinic that delivers HIV care is, is too overwhelming. And that's why we have a lot of people out of care. Why, why do people who are depressed not get engaged in care? Well, what do you do when you're depressed? Nothing, right? You don't water your plant. You don't take your dog out. You don't eat. You, you live in the dark on the couch or on a bed, and you put the covers up, and you don't know what time of day it is because you're depressed. And there's treatment for that. But I have to find you. I have to know that that's going on for a patient before I can treat them for it. So. HIV has a very high stigma index, and the, in, the impact of that stigma is uh, just unfortunately it affects outcomes. So we have people dying of AIDS when there is no reason for anyone to ever die of AIDS ever again. That was from the 1980s. Uh, the medicines we have right now are great. I have friends of mine who are 75 years old and living with HIV and still nursing and still social workers and still practicing, and teachers, and professors. So there is no reason why anyone has to die of AIDS. What, why people die of AIDS is because they're ashamed or they're not feeling connected to their care providers. And that's something that obviously I'm very passionate about. I'm going to breeze through a couple of these. Um, the no-show rates that we have for our patients are, in some cases, astronomical. Patients will hop from just like they do for pain meds, they'll hop from provider to provider so that they're not known because they don't want anyone to go, oh, I've seen him twice at that clinic. That must mean he has HIV. And just to remind you, I work in HIV clinics, and some clinics are only about HIV. When I walk through that door, there is a contagion of HIV so that people will come up to me and say, 
um, you work in HIV, don't you? Oh, don't you? I, I think I see you going in and out of that clinic a lot. And then I'll be told that, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, that, that they don't want their family to have associated with me because I might give their family HIV. Now, is that mean, horrible? No. What it is, it's misinformed. It's misinformation. And misinformation is a terrible thing. So I have to go back and talk about that. I've had patients in the Virgin Islands who have been put outside with the dog because the family will not allow someone who's HIV positive to live in the house. These individuals live with the outside animals. They are fed food on a paper plate. They are not allowed to eat with their families. And I know that we think, oh, well, that's far away. That's in the Caribbean. But that happens here in the United States as well. All right, so I just want to make you so aware of how important it is for us to make patients who are HIV positive feel welcome and to feel like human beings and give them that respect that they deserve because we cannot get it casually. We absolutely cannot. Spirituality has a place in culture as well, and we, we like to learn about that, whether it's a very formal religious uh, effect or uh, engagement or whether it's a spirituality about the world is a big place and there is an over big you know a, an, a, a being of sorts that is important to keeping the world at balance so spirituality is a part we have culture clashes and I've explained some of those to you what happens when patients don't connect with us for whatever reason and they tune us out and they disengage and then we've got the patient who's just, I call, unplugged. Just totally, they're not playing in the sandbox anymore with us, okay? They've had it, they're done, they have too many other factors in their life, and it's not worth the effort. Now, some of these folks are depressed and they need treatment for it, because what we find is those individuals who get treatment for their depression often get re-engaged into care, because they feel good, they start to feel better. Cultural leverage is when we change things going on in our communities, and in our culture systems, our clinics, to encourage culture diversity, to be sure that we're welcoming to all cultures. So that's that critical thinking that goes on at a high organizational level. What promotes an engaging partnership with our patients? Growing it from the ground up. Whether you're talking about coconut cream pie, or you're talking about what you're growing in your, at your farm, or what your day was like, and where is your son that's been missing? All those things are important for us to engage our patient, finding out what's important to them, what's high priority, discuss those things, and then we can add on the things that are important to keep them well so that they can address these important things in their life. Communication is the key, as I'm sure you all know, and that integrated care, that respectful integrated care that culture is an important aspect of. Here we are, here's patient care. Guess who walked away? Who is it? It's the patient. So how do you have a team meeting if the patient isn't in care anymore? You can't. So I tell the patients that are, I find again, I say, we are trying to have a team meeting and we're all here for you, but we can't do it until you're here. You're the most important part. You're the, you're the head of the table. Allowing patients to hear that, that they're, this may be the only part of their life that they're important at. They may go home, they may be abused sexually, verbally, physically. They may not have any rights back at home, but when they come to us, they're the most important thing going on. And I'm telling you, when I use that approach with my cultural diverse population that I work with, suddenly people who are dressed sort of shabbily and have no light in their eyes, that are peaked, suddenly are coming in and they're dressing up and they're saying good morning to everybody when they come into clinic. It's a powerful change. And then when we name that change, you look like you're feeling good. You look like something's happening. You look like a different person than when I first met you. There's a sense of, I can do this. I can self-manage my disease. I want to learn more. And there's nothing more exciting as a provider, as a healthcare worker, to have that going on. So here's our patient, allowing them to put up the blocks that are necessary, the steps to take to engage in their own care. And we go back to motivational interviewing, which I'm a big proponent of, resisting that writing reflex, not telling them what they, I think they need to hear, but listening to them, understanding their motivation, and empowering them 
to take little baby steps and to try to get them to understand and make goals to lead, tiny goals lead to big goals. And open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. I know you've heard some of this. The explanatory models. Here's the chicken soup that I promised you. Look at all those different chicken soups. When I came to the Virgin Islands on your left down there, do you see the, the, the chicken piece? I'm a vegetarian. So when I saw this and I saw a whole chicken inside the soup, I was like, what is that? What recipe is that? And they said it's chicken soup. And you see everyone just eating the chicken and dripping all over and they're just having a ball. It's like eating fried chicken. All right? It's, it's just lovely. And I had no idea that there were so many different ways of making chicken soup. Look here, a Latino chicken soup to the right of me. Chicken soup comes in all cultures, but we all believe that it, it's good for the soul. And then the home remedies. In Jamaica, we have many tonics, and patients have beautiful colored bottles, and all these tonics are created in the bush. Um, and oftentimes I have to ask, uh, where did you get this? Who made it for you? And then I will often call or visit the healer that created it because where I live, it may be whatever's in your backyard. That might be lemongrass, but it also could be marijuana. So I need to know if people have. In fact, I used to do talks and they would say, Debbie, have some bush tea. This one we made specially for you. And I'm thinking, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, and the good thing is they knew that I didn't need to be having any with marijuana in it because that's just, they made it with just lemongrass for me, okay? So again, you get to know a culture, they know what you need and what you like, and they wanna, they wanna respect you as well. So there goes, respect goes both ways, cultural respect. And as you all know, understanding a person's belief system is so very important. That nonverbal communication, I had many patients who are Muslim. I made the mistake one time in front of a woman, her, she was very, very sick, I put my hand out to shake her husband's hand. I did not realize that in front of his wife, he could not shake my hand. That would be a slight to her that he would shake an unmarried woman's hand. So he apologized later, and then I went to both of them and apologized and said, I did not understand. Thank you so much, and I will learn from you, and please let me know. That right hand was the wrong hand too. If I had not been an unmarried woman and I had, I would have used the left hand because the right hand is for toileting. You never shake someone's hand if you are, um, you, you, right hand is for toileting only. Shaking hands is left hand. So again, something again that you didn't know, uh, that I didn't know. So all these very interesting cultural aspects of care that we have to learn as we go. I'm never competent until someone tells me. So I always say to the patients, please tell me if I'm doing something that makes you uncomfortable because I'm a learner too. And you're teaching me probably more than I'm teaching you. The language, look here in the United States. This is one sixth of the US population is, speaks uh, language other than English. It's a lot of people. So are we bringing the right education and are we doing it in the right language? Limited English proficiency is very important and we have class standards that you can look up. These are just things, there's so much to share with you, but I did want to tell you that these things you can look up and they're wonderful references for you. Uh, medical translators, very important. Don't use family members. Use medical translators. They've been trained to know medical terminology. And health literacy, very, very important. What, that's where the pie and analogies come in. How do we help individuals who may not know what a virus is understand what a virus is? Do we talk about the king and the wall around it and protecting the immune system? There are many things that you could come up with that would help a patient understand what the immune system is and what a virus does when medicine isn't there to help protect the immune system. So let's see where else. Are, oh, and pictures. I had a patient of mine that was Latino. She went home with a prescription for um, once a day medicine, okay? Well, she didn't understand it. Onze is 11. She took 11 doses of the medication instead of once. She did 11. Obviously, this woman was very sick, and now we use pictures so that no one goes away from the clinic without getting the information in a picture format. So that even, just, I can't assume. I had patients in Appalachia uh, in uh, 
up in many mountains that put National Ge Geographics on the coffee table, but they didn't read. I thought they did, but then when I gave them a care plan for their child and looked at different exercises to be doing for developmentally delayed children, I found out that they couldn't read anything. So the, who, who was the National Geographic out there for? It was for me to let them, they wanted me to feel that they knew how to read because they didn't want to feel badly about themselves. And I wasn't going to feel badly, but they didn't know that. So it was better to put the National Geographic out there. So communication is the key. And I think looking at patients and who they are. In this scenario, I gave this, I do a lot of teaching. I spoke to a group of students and I said, this is our patient today. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I've highlighted some of the things that would probably be very um, challenging for students for the first time meeting someone who's HIV positive or potentially HIV positive. Okay, so the students came up to me and said, and this was medical students, nurses, social workers, I had a large interprofessional group, and they said to me, um, he knew he was at risk for HIV. He could have done better than this. I mean, you know, and why is he going to clinics all over North Florida and Georgia? You know, Miss Seifer, this is too advanced for us. We don't know what we're going to talk about with him. He sort of put himself in this situation. And I said, aha, I thought you were going to say that. And then I said, let's take another look. I left out some things. I saw this patient and I said, there's something missing here. We can learn about this patient better. Let's find out more about him. Do you see that I've added some information? Things like he works as a bartender and volunteers three hours a day. He's articulate, he's energetic and personable. That he's in a new monogamous relationship with a professor at a community college. That he brought his medicines with him. So he actually brought stuff in so we could see it. This is a, these are positive things, these are strengths. Yes, he's got some work to do and we can help him, but Here's our real patient. Let's go in with the strengths and congratulate him for coming in today because he knew he needed to be seen. And let's keep him in care. And let's find out why he didn't go to the health department. Maybe he has a family member there and sure enough, his aunt worked at the health department. So why would he go to the health department with all of this health issues and lifestyle issues that he hasn't disclosed, be a lot easier to go to a, a clinic in another state than to go to your own home clinic. So again, looking at our culture and putting on a new set of glasses ourselves and seeing patients that are strengthened or ready and not looking at all their deficiencies. So that should be the culture. I am a big proponent as patients, as partners, and I believe in culturally mindful care, if you will. And I appreciate the opportunity. I have many books and references for you. I appreciate you staying late because I know I've gone over, but I hope that my message um, is, is uh, a, a good one for you and that you can take this and use it as soon as you walk out this door. Thank you so much.